These were not extreme athletes. These were people who lifted weights in a gym. Granted, they did it probably too much, but they, they weren't what we would consider, you know, uh, fanatics. And, and those who, who, they ran some, they played tennis, whatever their thing was, now they're paying such a price physically that I think that that's almost conclusive evidence that the body wasn't designed for that sort of recurring strain versus the, the recurring activity of walking. I haven't heard anybody say, I'm having to replace my knees or my shoulders or back surgery because I walked. And you never will, <laughs> most likely. Life's Third Act is a podcast dedicated to helping you get the most out of your retirement. Sponsored by Tucker Allen, attorney CPA Joe Cordell features guests each week to discuss prominent topics for those over 55. Here's attorney CPA Joe Cordell. Welcome. Uh, This is Life's Third Act, and we're continuing uh, the conversation that we left off with. Uh, For the introduction of that, go back to the beginning of the previous episode but I think you'll enjoy this discussion. Well, you know that that phrase we've all used and it's been in the English language for, I don't know how many decades or centuries is, you know, he or she can't think on their feet. Uh, there might have been more depth to that observation, you know, that, that ultimately, I guess, to survive a million years ago, you know, it's really thinking on your feet when the saber or five million when the saber tooth tiger appears, right? Yeah, it's the you got to think quickly. Is is that moving bush uh, concealing uh, a tiger, <laughs> or is it concealing an antelope? One's a source of food, and one is going to make you a source of food. Yeah, and and if you think about it, all those critical decisions were made literally on our feet, moving uh, yeah, more absolutely. more commonly, and the fact that that can transposed to where we are today and you know with different types of problems but still that these this cognitive uh, process that you describe that's triggered by moving and walking I mean you it does make sense to me and that's the reason I I wonder to what extent do people really regard this in the sort of um, a premeditative way that they say you know I'm going to go walking to solve a problem I don't hear that very often but no, and I, I think it, people don't realize that actually there is, this is a way of solving problems. You know, we, we have this idea that we, we have to be engaged in furious activity. We have to be pounding our keyboards. Uh, we have to be working the whiteboard, whatever it happens to be, to solve a problem. When actually, sometimes problems don't have obvious solutions. You, you know, they're not equations that you can write down and calculate an answer to. They're sometimes fuzzy. And sometimes part of problem solving is actually not solving the problem. It's defining the question around the problem. Uh, And once you can bring that into sharp relief, the solution can actually present itself very quickly and very easily. And getting out and just doing this kind of contemplative, focused, non-focused cycle of walking is a very, very good way of doing that for you. Strong roots are essential for a healthy tree, especially your family tree. That's why you work hard to take care of your family every day. At Tucker Allen, we know that taking care of your family means planning for the future. Our team provides personalized estate planning to help you protect your family, your legacy, and your future. From wills and trusts to long-term care and estate planning. Count on Tucker Allen. Personalized estate planning made simple. So when you mentioned the the, the social piece, um, which is something that isn't always practical. And in fact, it sounds to me like may not always be desirable, but clearly your point is that when you, you know, when you put that dimension into these other activities that are going on when you're walking, then it's kind of the, the, um, you know, the perfect elixir. And so um, as this pertains to problem solving, I have to tell you that I haven't done this often, but I've done this a few times. It's been really beneficial. I'm a lawyer uh, and I, uh, I have uh, attorneys that I work with and whatnot, and so we will uh, sometimes have a meeting. And I don't, I don't suspect that they all enjoy this. And maybe some of them, you know, would rather be sitting having a meeting at a at a lavish book dinner. But instead, I'll say, let's meet somewhere like at a at a park and let's walk, let's talk. And we haven't done that many times. We've done it a few times, but. Um, 
other than not being able to have the eye contact, and you can, you can turn your head and have the eye contact. But even in the absence of that, where we're all thinking and fu- and talking and um, and moving together, um, I, they've always been beneficial meetings. They always have. But I never thought of it the way that the the basis that you describe here for why that might be true. Well, consider further what's going on when you're walking in the under these conditions. So especially if you have to have a difficult or contentious conversation with somebody, which sometimes happens in life, unfortunately. If you're walking with somebody, you both fall into synchrony with each other, uh, which is something that we find positive and enjoyable. Somebody with short legs will speed up a little in terms of their walking. Somebody with longer legs will slow down a little. So we walk at the same pace. If you watch people from behind who are walking together, uh, you'll see that their arms move at much the same rate as well. So there's synchrony in terms of gross body movement. But even more deeply than that, what you'll find is that there's a kind of anti-synchrony going on as well. Uh, When I'm talking, you're breathing in. When you're talking, I'm breathing in. So we've got this kind of phasic relationship with each other. And we're also paying attention, not to each other, but we're paying joint attention to where we're going to. So the metaphor of, of you know, we, we solve the problem by walking it off uh, or we, we're walking to the solution is actually, in a, in a sense, to my mind, very well founded because we're both walking in the same uh, direction. And there's actually a little bit of literature, sadly not enough, uh, to show that when you give people difficult problems to solve and you give them this uh, task of walking and talking together, um, where they're walking in the same direction, that they arrive at solutions uh, much more quickly than they would have done had they been sitting down facing each other across a desk. That's not to say that there aren't times when you shouldn't sit down and face each other across a desk, but uh, for primates, and we are primates, facing each other can be aggressive. Um, whereas talking about something contentious when we're not facing off against each other is a really good way of getting around the kind of aggression that might accidentally intrude into a conversation, and it keeps you focused on a particular direction of travel, which is metaphorically to solve the problem and physically to actually engage in the trajectory that you're engaged in. Yeah, and you think of kind of like the antithesis of that, and which, for example, is in America, the traditional business lunch. And what until recently was a lunch that would include two to three martinis. Uh, that uh, while well, while that may be more pleasurable and satisfying, and and for which there can be good things said, um, still, if the subject is strictly health and and the sort of cognitive benefits and creativity that you describe, I mean, I just think that that in many ways that is the antithesis to approaching a problem versus um, versus that that sort of uh, all senses engaged, including physical movement uh, of walking. Yeah, instead of sitting down to hash it out, go for a walk together to hash yeah, it out. Yeah, you know, Americans may have invented that that big lunch with the martinis. I don't know. I, I, do, do we bring that over from the old country? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I I think that many people feel it's hard. Let me take a step back. When I whenever I talk to my daughter, who she's in medical school, and here in at Washington University in St. Louis, and and she, uh, it's hard to get her and her sister's attention when I talk about the benefits of just walking. And instead, their focus tends to be they they think they have to do something extreme like being a marathon. So whether you maybe I wouldn't call that an extreme sport, but. But many younger people think that that walking is for old people, and that and that it, it can't possibly, you know, strain your body enough to get the benefit. That this whole idea that you've got to suffer, and I'm, I know that that there's evidence that there's some benefit cardiovascular to to some elevation of the heart. So I'm sure you and I agree on that. But still, the, this idea that there's no benefit from walking is, I, I don't know if it's more of a modern uh, idea that that. Ever since Kenneth Cooper, who was this guru in the U.S., uh, made uh, aerobics very popular in the 70s, probably had a counterpart there. Maybe he was popular in Europe. But um, in the 70s, launched this this great, you know, huge social movement toward uh, aerobics. 
and and it became more and more uh, demanding. And ultimately, now they have. It's much more common to participate in either a half marathon, which is, I guess, what, uh, 13 miles, and yeah. a full marathon, which is 26 miles. And and what what your research shows is that, you know, you can probably get even the health benefits alone, not to discourage occasional running or whatnot, but, but you can get all those health benefits without the price you pay in terms of joints. One thing I'm seeing now, and I don't know how many people I've talked to, but maybe because I'm hanging out with people my own age, I'm 65, and all these people around me are saying, gee, I wish when I was younger I hadn't done all those things I did because they're replacing knees and, and, and uh, shoulders, uh, they're having back surgery, all this damage to the body. And and whenever I see that happening on such a large scale among people who, these were not extreme athletes. These were not extreme athletes. These were people who lifted weights in a gym. Granted, they did it probably too much, but they they weren't what we would consider, you know, uh, fanatics. And and those who, who, they ran some, they played tennis, whatever their thing was, now they're paying such a price physically that I think that that's almost conclusive evidence that the body wasn't designed for that sort of recurring strain versus the the recurring activity of walking. I haven't heard anybody say, I'm having to replace my knees or my shoulders or back surgery because I walked. And you never will, <laughs> most likely. The, there, there is actually some data on this. And uh, if you compare uh, injury rate per million steps walked, per million steps run, uh, what you find is that the rate of injury in running goes up like this, and the rate of injury from uh, walking stays flat. You know, and this is a message, though, that uh, should should be spoken to uh, to younger people who who aren't interested in walking, and they seem to think that because they can, that their body allows them to do this, that they should. And in, and that it doesn't necessarily flow from the fact that you can run and you can lift huge amounts of weights and you can play tennis for forty hours a week. It doesn't mean you should. And but but that's not the messaging with younger people, at least in this country, largely in terms of um, exor- quote unquote exercise. Well, I, I think there's a couple of comments to make. One is that, of course, you can play tennis and you can play it right throughout the course of life or whatever it happens yeah. to be. But, and there's always a but, uh, amateurs typically don't understand things like rest recovery ratios. They're not paying attention to the signals within their bodies that are saying, you're putting this under strain. They're not, you know, for example, under the care of professional coaches. Uh, the same is, is true of runners. There, there, There's quite a literature now showing that actually you can reduce the rate of injuries in running if you are trained by a professional in how to run. Uh, but I, I, I've i seen it here myself. I'm sure it's true in the States. Uh, I see people running and what they're doing is planting their heels very heavily into the ground rather than running properly so that they get the spring and absorb uh, the energy and distribute it right throughout their body. And of course, if you're juddering your body consistently like that, you're damaging your heels, you're damaging your knees, and they're running on tarmac, they're running on concrete, uh, you know, they're running on surfaces that were not actually adapted to run on. You know, running on the beach, lovely sandy beach, and your bare feet, you're not going to injure yourself. Running on grass, <laughs> again, the same. But we don't have bodies that are adapted to run on tarmac atom or on, on concrete. And we need to be trained properly how to do these things. But people think, I just put on a pair of running shoes and go for it. Uh, but that's not actually how it works. Whereas happily, that's pretty much how it works where walking is concerned. Put on a nice pair of shoes and away you go. And and uh, you're not going to suffer uh, those kinds of problems. But do you think, though, though, if we if we say, OK, our God should be what humanity over time became. And if we believe then that human beings for millennia were engaged in typically in the week, in the level of strain on joints and knees that we we see in the modern West among a lot of people who are athletes or simply professionals who are, regard themselves as serious about their exercise or their sport. I just suspect that, or I've imagined that 
when you had hunters and gatherers, as we were, I guess, for long before with the agricultural revolution, um, that that this was, I don't want to call it a sedentary because that contradicts what you and I are talking about here. But I don't think that it's the sort of day that many of us imagine where you're continually under stress and strain and lifting and you know, using the the, the sort of um, muscles and joints that are required f- with, say, a heavy tennis schedule, or not to mention weightlifting in a gym five days a week. Wait, can, would you comment on what your thoughts are? Yeah, so the, the, there's actually quite a bit of work ha- has been done. Uh, Daniel Lieberman at Harvard and uh, Ponser, uh, whom I've mentioned at, at, at Duke, on these uh, populations uh, who are living like this now. And what's remarkable, <laughs> there's a lot of things that are interesting about these populations, but they they do exactly as you say. They have active lifestyles, but they don't spend their time burning themselves out. You know, the idea of weightlifting for fun is something that would be anathema to them. Uh, you know, they have an energy budget, and if they spend a lot of energy uh, building muscle, well, then they have to go out and hunt a lot more animals to get the protein to build that muscle. So th- they're in a good metabolic balance in terms of their energy demands, the energy that they take in and the energy that they put out. They sit around a lot, but interestingly, they sit in a kind of way which is different to the way that we sit in the West. They sit on their hunkers. So they they hunker down um, or they'll sit on tree stumps. Um, they typically don't sit on chairs with backs. Uh, this is a kind of a Western thing. So their sitting is active rather than passive sitting. So do they have lower back pain from being seated in a chair where you're crushing your coccyx all day? No, of course they don't. Um, do they have very strong, supple backs because they're moving a little bit all the time? Yes, of course they do. Uh, do they have the kind of activity-related injuries that you can accumulate from repetitive strain Uh Generally not. Um, but are they good at doing things like throwing spears, carrying things, all of that? Of course they are. But they they have a lithe musculature rather than a hypertrophic uh, musculature. That I, uh, I never thought of that from the perspective you just described. Um, that is fascinating. In other words, simply from the standpoint of an energy budget. So you have to have the luxury of lots of food to be able to recreationally spend a thousand calories. You know, it's yes. like it's like being rich. And to be able to spend a thousand dollars, you've got to first be rich. Yes, exactly. And and so it does make sense that they wouldn't engage in activity that any more than was necessary. And it is necessary to hunt and it is necessary to get and is that is necessary to walk. Uh, yeah. But the idea of running around a field for 26 miles in a day or two days, that would serve no purpose. No, they would have to go and find a lot more animals to eat. Or That would take a couple of buffalo. <laughs> yeah, or harvest a lot more honey or go after a lot more tubers. Uh, so they have a very good energy balance, whereas in, Western wor- in the Western world, uh, we have excess calories everywhere. We've solved the problem of food getting. But what we don't have is a metabolic balance between the food that we take in, um, the the way we burn that food, and the activity that we engage in. Yeah, that's a whole different show. Uh, and yes, America, unfortunately, America has had a lot of influence around the world. And I'm afraid that uh, sometimes it's not been good. And and uh, uh, I guess we were the original ones whose uh, average body mass, you know, has achieved. Uh, I think we're 50% obese, 50 or 60%. It's a shocking number. But uh, so I think it's about to come to your way in Europe. I think it it, it has been, unfortunately. Uh, but again, you know, there's quite a bit of data on things like the type of food people are eating. You know, if, if you're eating a diet that uh, is not ultra processed. So, you know, uh, if you were to go to a Hadza and say, Here's a donut, a Boston cream. They would go, ooh, that's very nice. I've never encountered something like that. Uh, Instead, they have to engage in food preparation. If they want something sweet, they have to go and find a source of honey or a source of, you know, fruits, excuse me, or whatever it happens to be. Whereas we have easy access to these highly palatable, highly digestible foods. So, 
you know, again, I, I, I was looking up something recently on on diet in the 1800s. And uh, if you look at, for example, things like what were people eating for breakfast? Uh, you know, if you were from a poor family, you would have had a diet of rough oats. And if you were very lucky, you would have had a little bit of honey and maybe uh, a little bit of buttermilk or something thrown into that. And the calories in that is actually quite inaccessible. Your body has to spend a lot of time breaking it down. It's it's a kind of a, quote, high glycemic index or a low glycemic index food because you have to spend energy to capture the energy. Whereas now, you know, you can walk out, we can do it here just as you can do it there and go down to the local shop and get yourself a high calorie, highly palatable uh, energy laden food that your body can extract the calories from with relatively little effort. And if you're a Hadza or somebody living in a traditional lifestyle, that's not so possible for you. The Mediterranean diet is a good example, though, of, of a modern diet uh, where the calories are relatively inaccessible. You know, it's a very fiber rich, uh, high fruit uh, diet. Um, lots you, of plants. Cheeses, lots of plants, lots of olive oil lots of nuts, lots of things that, you know, you have to spend a bit of time preparing and you'll spend quite a bit of time digesting, but you'll feel full for a very, very long time. Yeah, yeah. And and even I, I, the olive oil, I, I'm told that uh, traditional Italian cooking, if we went back a uh, hundred plus years ago, was more olives rather than olive oil, which, you know, makes it even less, you know, accessible in that yeah. way. So, um no, no, it, I'm glad that we got here. We're out of time. It's a marvelous interview. Uh, I'm glad that we had time to touch on diet here toward the conclusion. Uh, so uh, just a, a point to walk away with in terms of a goal for, for walking. Um, what you said as we started the show would be that, uh, is it fair to say shoot for something between five and 10,000 steps a day? Is that, would that be maximal? I, I think turn uh, on the walking app on your phone or on your smartwatch or whatever it happens that you have, and just see how much walking you do. Most people will be surprised by how little walking they do. Uh, so the first thing you have to know is how much you're doing. And then I think the, you know, if, if you're the average Western adult, you're doing around about four and a half thousand steps a day. My advice is add 5,000 to that. So that's easy, actually. You know, take a phone call, don't sit, walk. Um, if you're driving to the shop because you have to do that, park as far away from the shop as you reasonably can in the car park and walk. Uh, if you go out for your lunch, walk to a cafe that's further away than you would normally uh, walk to. Uh, if there are stairs, take the stairs. Set an alarm on your on your phone, on your computer or whatever, get up and walk around for a couple of minutes every half hour or so. There are lots of ways to build little snippets of walking in right throughout the course of the day and then have a, a partner in crime, you know, have somebody that you like to, that you uh, will go with for a walk. Um, we are social walkers. We're very good social walkers and social walking can be great fun. You know, a WhatsApp group or a, a Facebook group or whatever uh, is an easy way to meet up with people. There are lots and lots of ways of doing this. I, I suppose the the way to think about it is that you you should set this as a kind of a a little goal for yourself, and you will discover just how enjoyable it is uh, if you do this regularly. Yeah, and look forward to it. And uh, and then again, people should keep in mind what you said about the problem solving uh, potential uh, and uh, the huge benefits that you can reap apart from the health that that you're and you will enjoy as a result. And and on the basis of this conversation, I can tell you I'm going to have more of those uh, more of those walking discussions or meetings. Uh, Shane O'Mara, uh, marvelous, marvelous. And I hope that that we can induce you to to come on again and talk further about related topics. I'm especially interested in your brain research. Um, so you're at Trinity College Dublin. Your book is um, in praise of walking. So where That's can, right. that can be obtained, uh, I assume, at Amazon and wherever. Amazon, it's it's easily available on Amazon. It's probably the, the, the simplest place to go. Okay, marvelous. And thank you for your time. And thank you for the invite. This has been another episode of Life's Third Act. Till next time, take care. You've been listening to Life's Third Act. 
a podcast for thriving in retirement. Sponsored by Tucker Allen, your estate and elder law advisors. Each week, we discuss topics and answer questions to help you better plan for your future. For more information, visit TuckerAllen.com. Subscribe and listen again next week for another edition of Life's Third Act. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely on advertisements.